The victim is missing his face, but the evidence screams murder. You can envision just a young guy headed to California to make his fortune. And the dark side of the California gold rush comes to the surface. Your fingernails will turn black. Then your hair will begin to fall out. Finally, you'll go insane. We could have come from anywhere. Now, 160 years after his death, science will try to tell his story. It's tantalizing to think that these may be the bones of Isaac Alderman. But even though the buckshot fits the newspaper account, the report said nothing about musket balls. Still, it's Xanthi's only lead, and she runs with it. Taking the artifacts to ballistics expert George Wonderlich, director of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Has she found the lead shot that killed Isaac Alderman? What do you think? It work. No. <laughs> and I don't need to look. Let me show you something. I've got some buckshot here that I use. Look in the bag, and I'm going to put what you think is about an equal volume into your hand. Weight difference? Oh, yeah. This is much heavier. That's not lead. No. Nope. That could be dirt. That could be the droppings of certain types of insects. That could be pebbles. But whatever it is, it's not buckshot. But it's not buckshot. If that's not buckshot, it's unlikely that Sacramento man is Isaac Alderman. But George suspects the victim, whoever he was, could have been gunned down. George is confident that the larger piece of lead was a bullet fired by a typical 1840s plains rifle. He spotted a tiny telltale feature of frontier ammunition. First of all, you have to understand there are two different ways to make a bullet in the 19th century. One is you can drop it through a shot tower. As it falls through the air, it becomes a perfect circle, and then when it gets to the bottom, you catch it in water with a soft sand at the bottom, and you just scoop them up. George has two authentic lead bullets. The one manufactured in a shot tower is perfectly spherical. But this one has the bump. Oh, okay. And that bump is called a sprue. And the bump is caused by a mold. Using pure lead and the same campfire mold from 160 years ago, George shows Xanthi how bullets were made on the frontier. Who would have actually been doing this, and what does it tell us about the individual I'm looking into? That's a problem. Anybody, oh. anyone who had a gun, could have and would have been making these bullets for their own use. Every person would have had a gun either for hunting, for feeding themselves, or possibly for self-protection. And that's what we have to look at. We'll see how this one turns out. See the yep. screw right there. So the bump on George's bullet seems to match the bump on the larger item found with the skeleton. Xanthi needs to know how it could have been flattened while leaving no traces of lead on the bones. Could this shape have resulted from only hitting soft tissue? No, it could not. However, it could have resulted from firing through something that the man had on his body. For instance, a leather belt, um, a belt buckle, uh, a tin pan. So the bullet would have been deformed before it hit the soft tissue? Before it got into the soft tissue, exactly. If it's not showing up on bone, then we have to start looking externally to the body. The flattened shape and the sprue on the larger lead item clearly make this a bullet that has been fired. If it didn't hit Sacramento Man's bone, it could have been deformed by hitting something he was carrying. But the lack of a sprue on the smaller piece of lead means it could be anything. What we may be looking at in this one is it may not be a bullet at all. In the 19th century, lead was used for everything from canteen nozzles that you drank out of to all kinds of plugs almost anything you needed a soft metal for. So this may have been something that he simply had in his pocket. That leaves the large flattened bullet. But the question remains whether it could have killed Sacramento Man without leaving a trace. George devises a ballistics test to find out. So we're going to use the rifle. We're going to fire through a belt buckle on a leather belt. And we're going to try and stop the bullet in ballistic gel and take a look at how much deformation we have at that point. Ballistic gel mimics the density of human flesh. 
It will allow George to catch the bullet and analyze the form it takes. A rifle, because of the way the grooves are cut in the barrel to cause the bullet to spin, the bullet itself will actually turn in the air. We know physically that a spinning object reduces a change in direction, which means it's going to fly perfectly straight for as long as it can before gravity takes over and causes it to hit the ground. So a rifle for long range shooting for especially hunting purposes is much preferred. It's slow to load, but you're going to hit what you're aiming at. And now, George aims to solve this mystery once and for all. George's replica planes rifle is charged to propel the lead bullet into the ballistic gel at 750 feet per second. Oh! oh. That was pretty good. Let's have a look. Well, we certainly accomplished what we wanted to. Oh, my goodness. Oh, look at that. It tore right through the buckle. You can see we've got several pieces of shrapnel. Yeah. And there's the ball in there. There it is. Look what it's done to the metal on the front. You can see what it would do to a body if it would do that to metal. Huh. Is this bit to the belt? The gel reveals that the bullet isn't the only thing that would have entered the body. You, we've taken a bunch of leather. Huh? That's the, that's the back of the belt. So he could easily have died from infection. He could have easily died from infection. He could have easily died from bleeding. Even if Sacramento Man survived the shot through something hard like a belt buckle or canteen, debris carried into the wound could have caused a life-threatening infection. But something else has caught George's eye. The shape of the bullet trapped in the gel has erased his skepticism about the smaller piece of lead. It's concave. We may have two bullets. Really? Of different calibers. Actually, probably... I did not expect this much deformation. See a similarity? That's really incredible. I did not expect that we would get this good of a result. So you're really surprised. You thought I it was really one bullet. I really am surprised. I thought we had one bullet, and quite frankly, several archaeologist friends of mine looking at it said, I think we have one bullet, and I'm going to go back with photographs and say we need to rethink this. This is incredible. But then again, that raises the question why you've got two different caliber bullets associated with the same individual. Maybe two people didn't like him. <laughs> you know, the, the other question is, did one come from a pistol and one come from a rifle? Because let's, let's look at it this way, OK? I shoot you from long range. I don't kill you. Boom. Now convinced he has two bullets, George looks more closely to see how they might be connected. If you rotate these just a little bit, they seem to fit very nicely together. There's one other possibility here that I just thought too wild to even bring up. However, if the person carrying this weapon wanted to make doubly sure that you know what he hit went down, it is not inconceivable that the person who fired this put the correct size slug in the weapon and then just to be sure put another slug on top of that slug. It is not unusual in this time period. They called it buck and ball. They really meant to stop someone, didn't it, they? It at least has to be considered huh. as a possibility. Incredible. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I learned something wow. today. Whoever shot Sacramento Man aimed to kill. <laughs>